Hello and welcome back ladies and gentlemen to Beyond the Summit presentation of uh, the Galaxy Battles to South American Qualifier first round match between T-Show, Rising, and Ten Mad Kings. Remaining. So this is going to be game three of this best of three series and if we are looking Five at a score of one remaining. to one of course. Uh, first game went in favor of T-Show. They had a really well-rounded draft where Mad Kings were kind of uh, focused much more on the early mid game and, and just seemed a little bit one dimensional with exception to, to the anti mage, which Yurita played pretty magnificently. But Radiant T Show team. had uh, an amazing Back. game one and kind of fell short in game two. I think that they still had the tools that, to make it happen if they wanted. Uh, well, not just wanted, but uh, were able to. But despite the wherewithal, they just really weren't coordinating on the same level, I don't think. And I think Mad Kings also got their act together in a big way. They were able remaining. to find. Uh, a lot more openings in this game, a lot more opportunities to really build themselves up in a, uh, some of the earlier fights. Pick. And then you just Work. got to see the Chaos Knight just go ham. And there really wasn't an answer to it for majority of the game. So really well played overall from Mad Kings, bringing it back in game two. But we've got our deciding game on our hands. So let's see how this one plays out as we see a few remaining. of the heroes get banned out here once again the the brewmaster the earth spirit banned out brood as Five well and remain. we're seeing the the viper the pa and the slaughter get taken out i think the slaughter is the key one here because that's what 444 has played in the support role both games and he has done really well with it maybe game two wasn't as just magnificent as game one but it was still very solid he still contributed in a big way and it still allowed them to take some key roshans where they normally wouldn't so I think the hero, in terms of its team fight potential, in terms of its early ganking potential, and in terms of its objective potential, I think it's just too strong. So they'll leave a few alternatives in the pool. We have Mad King picking up the puck and Rubik in response to the clockwork. And now we see Bane picked up as well. So this is uh, something that we got to see a little bit earlier in the CIS matches, is uh, some solid clockwork play can really make a big difference in terms of how the fights are spaced out. You can either get the initiations you want, or you could separate um, threats from their targets. It's just you could do a lot with this hero in the right hands. And of course, Bane has kind of been tried and true recently as he got so many cool new tricks up his sleeve starting in 7.07. .07. Puck and Rubik, uh, pretty much what you'd expect, are going to be able to fight pretty well in the mid game. A little bit ultimate dependent in terms of securing kills or, or fight opportunities, but just overall solid pickups and, and have some flexibility at least in the Puck's role. So good overall. Once again, the Medusa being taken Ten off the table. Remaining. Teams just don't want to have to really worry about it when it comes to the draft. Uh, they have to realize Five that it is a possibility. And rather than batting out like heroes that support it, you might as well just kind of nip it Dyer in the bud and, and take care back. of the hero itself. Um, and on the other hand, we have Beastmaster and Underlord, two very powerful offlaners banned out by Mad Kings. So, uh, going to be thinner pool for that offlane position. I don't expect Clockwork to really be filling that role either, as we've been seeing a lot more as a roaming four. So it very could be um, an important key pickup for the offlane here, as uh, both teams have less and less options available. Team and the third pick gonna come out. It is gonna be the Sand King. Very effective hero that some teams are actually first phase banning. Uh, just a lot of potential burst magic damage. Obviously key initiator and uh, fills that offline role very effectively. In the right hands and uh, in the right matchup, I should say. Because there are some Ten sets of heroes that can really remaining. shut down a Sand King and make it very difficult for him to farm early on. And he Five doesn't have the iron talent. Remaining fall back on like most offlaners did so it just it feels like offlane is harder and harder and there are you just have to get tankier heroes to compensate for it and who better than the tank himself tidehunter this hero i think is so amazing this patch i think his level 15 and uh, 10 15 and 20 talents all of them are really strong all of them are really high impact remaining. and allow him to just tank up to an absurd degree Five seconds but remaining. they're mostly focused on soaking up right clicks and right now we don't have a lot of right clicking heroes i mean rubik does get an attack damage talent at i believe level 10 but overall there's still a lot of magic damage emphasis here so you could go for like a hood of defiance blink dagger build perhaps and maybe go build that into pipe if you feel that trend continuing but in general i think tidehunter has he excels when you're trying to shut down a hero that uh, relies on their base damage to, to do general output most agi carries 
And dipping into reserve time, we see Mad Kings have to consider their response. How exactly do they want to find a hero that can push and pressure towers early, build tempo with their lineup to get maybe early blink daggers for their initiators, but also lane well enough against the tide? There's not a lot of great options there. I just really kind of limit the pool when this guy is able to just anchor smash and, and take 65% of your damage away. Or is it? It's even more, right? It starts at 60%, so it's more like 75% of your base damage with that anchor smash. It's, it's scary how much he can really do once he gets that talent. Either way, they keep on thinking about it. They ran the anti-mage previously and then the chaos knight in game number two. Um, don't think, don't like CK against Tide particularly. Uh, I don't think that he really brings that much to the table against him. So we'll have to see if they want to go back to the anti-mage or if they want to try something a little bit different that can still kind of put the pressure out in terms of the towers. Time keeps on ticking. Um, uh, heroes that can maneuver against the clockwork obviously are, are pretty nice. I used to say, we were seeing a lot of Murano when the patch first came out, and that triple leap was really shown to be how strong it can be. But uh, we're not seeing that in this region in particular. At least not recently. And they end up going back for the tiny, a hero that has been reworked enough times that nobody really knows exactly what to expect from this guy now. Um, his grab tree. And tree toss are pretty much a one point wonder now. You probably go for like a four, one, two build, something along Ten those lines. Seconds remaining. Depends. Um, your toss hits twice, so maybe you want to max the, the toss over it. Five but seconds either remaining. way, you definitely want to minimize your emphasis on the tree early on. It's not until you get the talent that reduces the tree's cooldown that you really are consistently swinging that thing around. I do like that it's in his loadout, though. The fact that he gets the loadout and is holding a tree as little man tiny at the beginning, that's pretty sick. And uh, T-Show Rising have to consider their response here. They have more magical burst damage, but with a little bit of physical added on. And Tiny's got team back. low armor early and high armor later. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, Lifesteal is a pretty solid pickup, though, against old Tiny and new Tiny. In the sense that... Uh, it's Tiny's a strength hero with low armor. This means that he's got a lot of HP and very little physical mitigation. Life Stealer thrives on that with his feast and should be able to target that very effectively. On top of that, um, doesn't really care about these spell effects. If he rages in, he's confident that he's not going to get caught out by the the sanking or any of the other spells coming through. So pretty good overall. Um, forgot to mention that we do have this matchup here, the classic one: Rubik versus Tide Hunter. And that can kind of make things very interesting. Remaining. The fact is, if you get a good spell steal off on Tidehunter's Ravage, you could turn remaining. fight so heavily in your favor. Um, the range is larger, but the speed is slower. So I actually think it's easier to spell steal than it used to be, because your position isn't as important as just making sure that you get it before the Anchor Smash. You'll probably still get hit by it, and hopefully you don't die in the Ravage. But if you can steal it and throw it back the other way, as soon as possible, I think it, it could definitely be a game changer. Final bands coming out here, Storm Spirit and Tinker, both teams potentially lacking mids. Uh, Tiny can definitely still mid, as he used to, but doesn't have to. Could definitely play the safe lane carry as well. So, considering their options here, T-Show Rising, banning out the Tinker. What are they looking for is the real question here. We've seen a lot of Death Prophet in the mid lane as a range intelligence core. Um, seems all right as far as options go. Um, but you, you'd love to have something that can carry the Infest Bomb, right? Like Clockwork can with the, the hook shot, but with the Clockwork being a support, you can't really guarantee it early on. So a lot of options in terms of mobile heroes. Could even look back towards the Ember Spirit. would be pretty solid, but they go for the Queen of Pain. And I think that's, that's a great pickup. Uh, overall, it really just rounds out their lineup in terms of what damage they're prioritizing. Even if Tiny gets a BKB, he can still be Anchor Smashed, beat down by Life Stealer, or Sonic Waved, or even Fiend Script. Like, the BKB is not a great option in this game, but if you don't, then you're going to get hit heavily by the Tidehunter Ravage, as well as just Five all their other spells, uh, and kited around with the Shadow Strike. So I think overall that Tisha Rising have a really solid draft, and it definitely can execute well enough to, to beat out Mad Kings, it just comes down to coordination, I would say. T 
show they showed that they have the execution in game one. They lack the coordination in game two. Templar and now Mad King's pick up the Templar Assassin. A very difficult hero to go up against without the right tools. So I think that uh, Mad Kings, they're going to be relying on their cores, mostly. Uh, making sure that Sankey, Tiny, and TA get rolling is pretty much the name of the game for them. But once they do, I think that there's a huge amount of potential. It's actually not going to be a offlane Sanking, as I was thinking. Now with the TA pickup, they're actually going to be throwing Sword on the puck in the offlane. And this puts Sladen onto the support, onto the four position. So Moger's going to play his true like six position support. He is going to be lacking a Blink Dagger for almost this entire game because he just buys so many damn wards that there's really remaining. almost no way for him to possibly afford it unless they're already rolling over their opponents. Slayton, remaining. on the other hand, he has a few options as far as how he gets this farm. Is he going to be just going for like Tranquil Boots and early ganking? Is he going to be stacking up the jungle a bit and seeing what he can farm from that? Is he just, uh, whenever TA goes to farm Ancients, is he just going to go ahead and soak mid lane? It, I mean, it's hard to say. But Support Sanking always has a little bit of trouble getting uh, the, the first bit of gold, but when he does, he creates so much value for his team in terms of initiation and the burst potential with uh, things like the offensive no field and just the, the burst of each of these heroes. I, I think that it's got to be pretty scary for T-Shirt. And, uh, but one thing uh, we do have to mention is that Hijack in both games, either on their Underlord or on the Puck, had trouble in his offlane surviving. And now he's playing a hero that, as long as he gets to, like, level 2, should Prepare have very battle. few issues with that. So shoring up one of their weaknesses, I think Tisho have a pretty good shot at getting into a solid mid game. The question is whether or not Mad Kings are able to start snowballing heavily enough with their spell sets, or if Tisho are able to kind of, like I said, coordinate find uh, the proper flanks and initiations and uh, get the job done strategically. So, it's gonna be pretty interesting. Sladen gets his boots already. So boots first, Sand King gonna be making his move around. And again, this is your kind of tried and true when Moger is supporting. He'll get every little bit of support items and you can feel free to get whatever you want. And, and boots is pretty much the ideal thing there. In the meantime, it looks like top bounty runes are going to be going for Tisha, and bottom bounty runes are going to be going for Mad Kings. Staying around in an area where they can kind of scout out smokes, I think uh, Tisha just want to see their, their opponents coming, and then they'll invade on this top bounty whenever they get the chance. <laughs> Cute little uh, opportunity to hide and wait for somebody to come in from the east side to try to pick it up, but that's just not going to happen. The battle begins. Slade looking for the ward. He's going to ward out mid. Uh, I get scouted out. Probably a bad idea at this point. Drops it down. And we'll see if that gets keywarded in anytime soon. Buck goes ahead, jumps up top here. Sword. Ready to. He should be in a pretty good lane. I mean, the Nightmare can be annoying. If you if you get open wounds and try to use your orb to escape, the Nightmare can screw you over really badly. But most of the time, you should be pretty free. You just do what you want on this lane. Sentry Ward for Madara is... Or for PTT, rather, is very important. Because it means that even if the Templar Assassin's skills melt, she doesn't get hit by the Shadow Strike. And, and that could be the difference maker between uh, able, being able to... Uh, keep the refraction up or losing the lane. Good hits on the puck. Already in a pretty sore spot. What is the sword? Is just going to get zoned out heavily by Long Blue here. Bottom, 4 for 4 and hijack. We're going to be able to put out some pressure, but yeah, puck has got to play it back for sure. Madara also lacking on HP right now. Has the fairy fire. Just going to pop the refraction now, but you look, it's already gone. And wow. Fairy Fire Exchange, is it going to be a first blood in favor of PTT? Yes! He'll even pop the healing self and walk away from the tower. Just gets dove on and there's no TP support. I mean, you can't say that you don't have a TP. Everybody on your team started the game with a TP. Only Puck used his. So the supports definitely had a window where they could at least punish the clock. If they don't save Madara there, they at least uh, are able to get a return kill the other way. 
but they were preoccupied. They were focused on what was going on down bottom, and down she goes. Madara is in a really rough spot now. This, shadow, like, this refraction is meaningless. This refraction does absolutely nothing against PTT's Queen of Pain. So, what what most people used to call this matchup like a 50-50, depending on the century ward and depending on like performance. But right now, it's so skewed in favor of the Queen of Pain. It's absolutely ridiculous. Sword, back up to full HP. He doesn't have boots yet, so still in a bit of a weird spot. And it looks like the Radiant Courier did get picked off somewhere around here. As PTT dies under tower court. <laughs> Trying to get the last hits here. Does not get it. Lulling Blue, unfortunately, not able to do much here. And uh, sorry, gets... At least some good experience out of this exchange and finds his boots. Slayed in very low on HP. He and the clockwork have just been going back and forth. 444. There's a lot of little fights on the side. Kind of drawing attention away from the lanes themselves. Hijack, 8 and 3, but most importantly, just getting experience and some good wand charges. And uh, obviously, Queen of Pain dominating. 15 to 3 right now in the mid. Um, with the potential for more very soon. I mean, she is level 4. Rapidly approaching five. Madara only just got there. I think it's going to be a pretty hard situation for the Templar's Assassin. In fact, uh, both the supports trying to change the tempo of the lane, but it looks like neither will have much of an impact. A little mana drain here, a little stun there, but just blink away and everything resets. And I have no idea why Mogur's here. Did he just teleport in to bring a sentry? And will that sentry actually do anything? Because we do see PTT trying to get away, and there is no Fade Bolt, because he needed one more auto attack to finish him off. Maybe two more, actually. Rubik's auto attacks early on are, low, are really low, 51 damage. So, Queen of Pain gets away with murder here. Just, uh... Set your ward. Eaten by Rubik, and uh, Queen of Pain just survives. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Clockwork's still kind of trying to find his way in the world, Radiant trying to find scanning. what contributions he can make. Flying for Courier finally coming out to TA, bringing her the Aquila and Boots. And a three man rotation up top here, leaving a, a 1v1 for Tiny versus Tide. Interesting situation. I mean, the Magic Stick makes it the Anchor Smash harassment not as impactful, and the Tree Grab obviously gives him a lot of depth of damage, but it's still annoying. I mean, he's still only hitting for 40 right now. And he'll just have to salve up. And Hijack is not afraid of anything now that he knows all three heroes are on the top lane. Slayden? Is he going to go for a smoke play here? Looks like it. Actually, just kind of trying to counter gank onto 444, and 444 turns around! Wow! He tries to set up an opportunity for the Queen of Pain, but they both just blink into a double stun, and that Queen of Pain has no blink left! She's gonna be dropped down too! Oh, what a disaster. If he had just kept on walking, I think he's fine. But they tried to commit, they tried to go for a cool combo, and the end result is two for nil. Oh, brutal. Alright, Jack will creep and skip, will use his arcade boots to keep himself sustained. But... Everything that they gained in advantage on the mid lane is now gone. And you look at net worth now. It's a, little, it's a little early, only six minutes, but you look at it. And what, what has Queen of Pain really done? She's 100 net worth ahead of Madara. Despite all the pressure that was put out on him early on. Despite, uh... The gank plays. Just, no. It's despite a solo kill. Like, he's outplayed him entirely in lane. And then one little slip up, and it's set back to even. That took help. Pace room for the clockwork, it looks like. Unless the Queen of Pain bottles it up. And PTT makes his way that direction, so... Haste the Queen of Pain with ultimate. Pretty scary. And we'll just keep an eye out. Oh. Warrior gets its shield. On cooldown. One more hit away. And yeah, the haste rune. I don't think it's going to be enough to pick... Fade out the Queen of Pain. She gets stunned up. Courier continues on its merry way. And Madara continues to farm the jungle. 
They're really trying to control these Ancients. That's that's the key here for Templar Assassin. She gets a big Ancient stack right here, then she's going to start snowballing out of control. So they go ahead, they control her Ancients. They try to ruin her, her laning phase, but still Madara persists and, and is making some pretty good trades. Things down bottom, looking for an opportunity on Yurita. He's got the TP scroll though, so they have to hold on. Get make sure the battery cell gets in range. And now he's in a bad spot. He'll try to shoot through the tree line, but he'll get ravaged. And it looks like he will be going down. Oh, the vision is lacking. There's no rocket flare on top of them, and it's gonna bring Yurita down low. But it's not gonna be enough to finish him off. They need that vision. They lack it, and they they lose it. Now Quidditch Bane gonna look for a return kill on Rubik. He helps kill off the Sand King and gets out with his life. And by that, I mean escapes despite the Sanky stuff. So, sorry, they're on the Sanky. Oh, well. Ruby, uh, life still are feeling pretty good about himself, though. Going to be finding that armlet at a pretty good clip. And I'm curious when the first Infest Bomb comes out thereafter. Looks like the, the burst damage from the Infest was enough to bring down the Sand King. But lacking the stuns Dyer's to bring down Mogra as well. That's a big DD rune. Could go one way or another, but now the nightmare comes through. Battery Salt breaks it a little early. 444 should have waited a bit, but they do have hijack on the flank. So I'm gonna try to go hard onto TA. No ability to meld and no trap charged up. First the Rubik will fall and Madara will fall with the Sonic Wave. Sladen caught out as well. Doesn't have the tranquils, but seems like he's gonna be okay. Kids always sandstorm away since they're good enough. Oh, two hits on the courier would kill it, and there is no glyph available. The shield is on cooldown. Silence on Queen of Pain will bring him lower, but it's gonna have to be on Tiny to try to get this kill. Avalanche, toss, right click, but he doesn't have a tree anymore. Oh boy, does not work out. They end up losing, and Life Stealer just keeps farming. Life Stealer should have the armlet coming to him very shortly. Yeah, Ari has it, everything but the blade of attack. And Midas is queued up for next. Or another armlet actually is queued up for next. Ooh, you know, you got two hands. You got two arms. Makes sense, that's one item you need to have. Nah, he's back to my Smoke, it might have been obvious, we'll see. Um, if they weren't looking, they wouldn't have seen it. It really comes down, they, the minimap did not make it clear to them. And uh, Theron's just rage TPs away. So this smoke, I don't think they're they're aware of it. They're obviously aware the clockwork is doing what 444 has been doing all game long, which is just being annoying and finding these weird flanks. But that's an awkward pause. That's actually a really awkward pause. At least it's not after the smoke breaks, but wow. So you've got Queen of Pain blinking in, nearly killing off Madara. He's making his way to the shrine. He has no wand and no refraction charges. So I think he dies to the next auto attack that's winding up right here for the Queen of Pain. But you can never be sure. Like, that attack's going in. But if he gets to the shrine, gets the first take of the shrine... Nah, I think he's dead. But either way, then now we have Mad Kings get to think about who's TPing where, who's going where. Can our TPs get cancelled? They have all this time to realize that, yes, all three of these heroes can TP onto Clockwork and Queen of Pain if they want to. They can choose if they want to TP to the shrine, to the tier 2. They've got options. They have a full enclosure on these heroes. And even with Bane as backup, I think that while this TA will probably die, that they're going to get big kills in return. I don't think it's entirely because of the pause, but it doesn't only factor in. And Madara lives through that auto attack. So. No kill on Madara. Gets the shrine, and, and the Shadow Strike tick was too far off, and instead they stay up top for the most part. The only TP that happened was Sanki coming down, and Hijack just meets him with a Ravage to finish him off and get the tier 1 there. Alright, so with the tier 1 down and a kill score of 5 to 2, we've got a 5,000 net worth lead for T-Show, with the, the experience at about 2,000. Clockwork making his way towards the Earnest Shadows, but Tide's almost got a pipe. And just Arcane Pipe is very scary. Sure, there's no Blink Dagger, but we've still got a lot 
that you can do against this lineup when you just walk in there with a pipe. I mean, you're already unkillable to physical damage. So the fact is, adding in this pipe of insight makes it extremely difficult for Mad Kings to focus any target that when Tide's involved. Falling Blue, pretty under leveled right now. And I don't believe he got the Helm of Knowledge. But we'll look for an opportunity on Sword to get silenced up. And there's a back off. So supports in general pretty under leveled here, if you look at it. This has been kind of the trend for this match, but you look at it and you've got your Sand King at level 5, Clockwork and Bane at 5, and then you've got your Rubik at level 4. These level 6s are so important for these early fights, but they've just been delayed and delayed. Shadowblade Echo Saber coming out for the Tiny. Maxing out Tree Grab. Just trying to go in for like, just a lot of sudden right click damage. I mean, you could go like, hit, with Echo Saber and Tree Grab, you can go hit, hit, throw. And immediately throw the tree for three free immediate auto attacks. The damage from Grow is not as strong as it used to be. It's only 30, 45, 60, Radiant but that's still a scary amount of damage in all in combo. Denied rune, but probably denied life. Mogur, he doesn't have a TP. So he's just going to be killed off for sure. It's a little satisfaction denying that bottle refill, but for the most part, costs them about as much as the DD rune would. And the tier 1's most certainly gone at this point, with a nice little observer ward here. They've got intel, and they're going to use it. They're going to go on Eureka now. Nice little toss out, two hits to break these cogs, but they're very slow auto attacks. And uh, he's going to be slowed down to a crawl here. He's going to Ravage to make sure of it. This kill is definitely theirs. Toss up, we'll put some damage the other way, but Eureka is going down. In the meantime, up top, Elon Blue has his Fiend's Grip. Has to be worried about both the Coil and the Waning Rift, though. That being said, there's no blink on Puck. The reaction might be slow. And they might actually try to go on Therence here. It's going to be a trade directly back and forth. Lol and Blue goes in. Fiend script canceled. And now the, they're in the nick of time as we do see the Dream Coil come out. So the Fiend script is still available. Cute little ward, but it seems like it was scouted out. And PTT. Finishes his Yule Scepter. Wants to get ready for his uh, debut initiation. Radiant if you jump in, Scream attack. Sonic Wave, you're pretty much dead against this team. You get stunned up by Avalanche or Pro Strike or any number of things, and you're just screwed. But uh, you can jump in freely with this Yule Scepter knowing your team has your back. And on top of that, you can do stuff like this. Oh my goodness, freebie on Sword. Finds the, the window with the short phase shift and uh, cancels out the, the orb. Nice little use of the cycle in there. Third use, of course, will be when this puck eventually does get Blink Dagger. You can you know, dispel the silence against you and just wait it out. But for the most part, it's just a good utility pickup that's going to allow him to, to stay alive when he needs to. And these levels are still so low for the Rubik. Uh, nice combo here, uh, but a better one as they flank up with the hook shot and with that infest. Find out the puck as well. Orb is available. Is he going to get a chance to use it here? He's just waiting for the cyclone play again. He's trying to do the exact same thing as before. And the result is uh, painful for the puck, but the cocks don't actually favor them. I'm not sure what 444 was doing there. And they're just going to chase him all the way to the tree line. If the, as long as they get sight on him with the rocket player, they've got themselves a kill. Takes a long time. <laughs> Takes a hell of a long time, but they do get it. Feed script on mid, possibly. They need some follow up, though. They need a TP scroll. He's got a max brain tap. He's got some real kill potential, but wrong place at the wrong time. Eureka and Madara are in route to try to kill off the thing. Uh, this is so awkward. Oh, I cyclone you. I banish myself with Nightmare. Oh, try to delay the fight as much as you can, but. The fight's gonna happen, and Sladen's looking for it. Is he gonna go for the epicenter on the high ground? Waits for it, but just goes for the double, 
and only hits one thanks to the Rage. Ravage hits on two, and now it's going to be Sand King and Medora that are in an awkward spot. Nice toss up from Eureka, but it's not enough to bring down the Clockwork. Clockwork jumps back in? Suicides? I don't know what's happening. But at the end of the day, we have ourselves uh, two very important core heroes killed off. The Tiny and the Templar Assassin do go down, even if the Clockwork could have walked away. Oh, interesting, interesting world to Dota 2. So we've got ourselves a Midas Armlet. Lifestealer, he's going to find that Radiance within the next, I'd say, 10 minutes. Might be a little longer if he has a shaky mid-game, but things are looking up right now. I mean, he's top net worth. He's feeling really good. His team is 11k. And he got a bounty room. I mean, that's the icing on the cake. Cherry on top. Oh, well. Anyways, we've got Guardian Grease coming along with the Pipe of Insight very shortly. Just overall gets the same tools. I'm assuming he goes Dagger after that, but right now it's a good option. Like, he's not afraid of anything. As long as he's not literally under tower, it, he just doesn't have to be worried. And even if he gets tossed under tower, it's like, whatever. Actually, self Yules is for Slade and... Or for... PTT. Not going to be enough to get him out of that one. Infesting up. So the clarity is not actually working while he's infested, is it? I mean, now you obviously don't lose health from armlet, so you would presume no. But he'll come out soon enough as they go for the Fiend's Grip, hook onto Sword, and bring him down as well. That Puck has now died three times. One of the most slippery heroes in the game, renowned for survival. He's just getting destroyed. It's really just good target priority from T-Show. They find their opportunities on these really high importance heroes, and they're racking up the kills. Now we see the Fiendscript stolen. Oh, lolling blue! It's getting a taste of his own medicine, but Brain Saps and Ring Smoke are pretty low here, so they're going to need a little bit more than that to finish them off. Dagger, finally! Oh, Sword. He's been working for it for so long, and finally, he hits 4k net worth. He gets his Blink Dagger plus Phase Boots, and he's looking to make something happen. Hopefully, uh, that is changing their current state of affairs, because that is a, a 10,000 net worth lead for T-Show. Looking to close out this Game 3 in the first round of the Galaxy Battle South American Qualifier. Okay, we're gonna hear a Ravage down bottom, just onto Madara. And uh, he doesn't really have anywhere to go without a dagger. They, however, don't have any detection, so they're just gonna kind of wait it out. And Madara probably do Refraction Mill, and just sit here and waste as much time as possible because they only have a handful of AoE effects. This is really awkward, and they will get him, but it will take a long time, and they infest for the kill. All right. Long drawn out encounter sets up Sword to finish off the top tier one. And uh, Glyph will be used to maybe make that a little more difficult. But they've got like four heroes headed up top, so Sword's gonna be fine. It's gonna be more of a question on what goes on down the mid lane. As uh, all of T Show are following up. There's a Shadow Blade, making detection even more important. He doesn't go for the Radiance, actually. Okay. So, I was going to comment on this uh, as I kind of saw it developing, but... We have ourselves a Desolator, much more common, tried and true build. Uh, guaranteed physical damage against low armor heroes. I mean, Tiny's up to, what, 15 armor now? That's alright. But just even the Desolator reduces that substantially. Dagger up for Sladen. Mentioned in the draft, but this can be a, a bit of a difficult thing for the Sanking. Like, if you dedicate yourself almost exclusively to the jungle, sure, you can get an 8-minute Blink Dagger. But that's not r the reality of a pro Dota 2. There's so much going on. You have to be active. You have to be involved in the fights. You have to take a few deaths. And they, the end result is that it's going to slow this thing down more and more. And I would say this is still pretty far below the, the benchmark that you're looking for. But he has it now. Let's see what he can do with it. The first epicenter of the game might be upon us. Dire Observer Ward, though, in a great place to see any rotation towards the pit. And, uh, it's gonna be a slow, slow rush on. At least they know about him. And they're gonna just go. They say, okay, well, you can Burrow Strike away, but we've, uh, 
really limited your options in terms of approach. And he's gonna go for a full reset. Well, this is taking a nice long time. It looks like T-Show don't want to do this anymore. Like, There's no reason to have one man first for Roshan. This is an attack on Titan here, guys. Like, Just spread your, your game plan out. If you want to do roast, do roast. If you don't, then get it together. Madara playing around with PTT. But the end, only thing that really happens in the past few minutes is uh, Sword picking up the towers. Tier 1 top, tier 1 bottom, all gone. Slade in a little bit of trouble. You really don't want to ravage this guy, but he does it. He drops it. Is it going to get him? Yeah. Anchor Smash just barely finds the range. So that's going to be your Guardian Creeps. It's about 300 away if he wants to save a buyback. And a smoke up. PTT, the lift, and the zap will do it. Normally, that's not going to cut it, but you get just one extra hero involved, and, and that's going to be uh, a nice creepy. And, you know, it helps when the hero walks right into you. The invis didn't even really come into play there. They're going against Roshan. Not sure about this stuff. They're, the, the Tidehunter tanking is good. Obviously, he's going to be able to withstand most of the pressure here, but now we see a jump in. Templar Assassin with a double damage rune does a lot, and that's going to be a nice little silence coming out from the puck. There is no Ravage, but there's no need if they can just kill off the TA fast enough. Now the damage all rests in the Tiny, who gets focused down. Ogre on the run, going to be dropping down to Epicenter, comes through his slate and drops it. And that is going to be doing some very nice damage in return. Life Stealer. Down, Queen of Pain down earlier. But in the end, you're losing your core heroes. The only reason that Mad Kings profit from that is because of how far behind they are. The fact is, that was a fight with where they had everything and T Show had nothing. They didn't have a Queen of Pain, they didn't have a Ravage, and they still come out with that kind of an exchange. It's not a good sign for, for Mad Kings. They need more. And they're looking for it here with the Queen of Pain again! She gets dropped down. Doesn't even get the chance to sell fuels. So that's that's a really tilting way to spend the, the past few minutes. These death timers are long, people. This is a level 16 Queen of Pain, and you'll have to remember they increase the death timer for heroes, and I think in the level 12 to 20 window. So she's facing the brunt of that now with 50 plus second death timers, back to back. Doesn't get to do anything this game. Go make a hot pocket. It'll be done in time. Just don't need it. Alrighty, we've got Yule Scepter on Puck, looking like a real hero again. It's beautiful. Going ahead, 10 intelligence picked up, probably goes for the damage next. Spell Amp's cute, but doesn't really change much this game. TA, how's she doing? Knocking it, looking for, looks like a Hurricane Pike. I was thinking BKB might be necessary this game, but he just kind of wants to be able to move around the cogs. Should be pretty good. And goes for the psionic trap damage, which I'm also pretty curious about. This trap damage only works on fully charged traps and still is like a damage over time effect. But the damage is pretty high. I mean, it's 350 damage with that talent. So it's definitely a, a substantial amount, but a hero that is designed to deal burst damage is now doing like Venomancer level dots. And I'm just like, interesting. I find it very intriguing, but I'm not sure how many kills you're actually going to get just through that damage. Well, they don't want him to see the, the Roshan health pool. They don't want Mad Kings to snipe it at the last moment by knowing the health level. And we do see Queen of Pain going in. self is forced out from the puck. Sladen's got his back, but doesn't need to commit to anything. TA's still up top. If TA doesn't move down, they're just going to take the rush for free. There's no question about that. If Sladen wants to make a move, but a Rocket Flare and an Urn of Shadows could be enough to stop that. They're going in. Orb is gone, so even with the self-heals, he's definitely dead, but Sanky coming in. 
trying to get the Aegis does not. Lifestealer finds it, and now Slayden is in some real trouble as well. Fiend script just to make sure about that kill. But uh, in the meantime, TA does take the top tier too. So, a little bit awkward trying to make that snipe happen. If they get the Aegis, it's kind of nice. They get the tier 2 tower, they get the Aegis, but in this case, uh, they get a Queen of Pain. Alright, and Poor Poor is like, I'm here, what do I do? Well, he does cancel one TP back, but now probably gets killed. No, Madara. Mogar blinks in, gets the hit! Is it going to be enough? No, the attack damage is insufficient. Oh, he didn't go for the plus 60 damage, Talon. I think he had more than 60 HP, but I still want to flame him for it. TA goes down on the top lane. Moger slips away with his double blink dagger action. But Rata Trap as well remains unfettered. This Queen of Pain's had a hard mid game, guys. The Queen of Pain in this stage with like an early Orchid at Yul should be like, I'm killing people. I'm a monster. And instead, she's just dead over and over and over again. Like three minutes death timer for the middle part of this game. Gonna be a nice little jump here onto Slayton. No Burrow Strike. And that's that. BKB up for Yurita. Any other cool item pickups coming through here? AC. I'll put the life here. Therence just now nabbed that one up. Along with his Aegis. And adding that with the Solar Crest, you've got a lot of negative armor. A lot to be worried about here is just you're going to be taking some pretty big hits. Oh, okay, Puck gets silenced, has to burn the Yules, but can he get the orb out in time? No, the Cogs lock him out, and the Fiend's Grip has burned just again to secure. Now going to be a buyback coming through on the Puck. Has the coil, is it going to be worthwhile? Gets it onto three, but the Ravage comes around. Madara just bought back, he's going to go down! Oh! Madara buys back Sword and Madara now on their last legs, and Hijack still sits here just wailing on their tower. He just doesn't care, people. He can pop the pipe. Oh, stolen Ravage, are you kidding me? Coming out from the Rubik, big jump in, but Theron shoes away with the Rage. Double stun coming in from the Sand King Slayton, resetting for another. Oh, but gets found out by the Clockwork in the tree line. Now it's gonna be Templar Assassin trying to meld away, trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a very farm lifestealer. Not gonna work, Madara, could this be a dieback? Gets knocked back by the Cogs and gets gone down by the Nyx. Yurita, in the similar situation, does get dropped down as well, and Hijack finishes off the Sword Puck. That is going to be four down. None of them have buybacks, and that's a mid lane of Rax. Oh, a clutch steal of the Rubik. Getting that Ravage out is such a big deal in potentially turning this game, but they just didn't have enough damage. They needed an Epicenter on top of that Ravage in order to make the kills happen to at least pop the Aegis of that Lifestealer. Well, they might do that now, but it's a little too late, buddy. Oh, they lose the barracks. They lose two buybacks. And they lose, I think, any foothold they had on this game. And now even like, sinking's down again. Just, what are you doing my swamp? Get out. And that's enough. The rage works out, but it's just cute little back and forth plays. It's not, I don't think anything matters at this point, guys. Uh, T show suddenly stomping all over Mad King's dreams. 18k net worth advantage through just that chain of two fights. They're so strong with Ravage that it doesn't even matter if Rubik's the one to pick it up. Uh, <laughs> just T show have so much to offer. And, and when you go toe to toe with a lifestyle that has AC, Desolator, and Armlet, and doesn't have to care about how low his HP pool is because he has Aegis. Just turn it in, boys. Irita did get a chance to pop his BKB, but didn't really seem to do much with it. And, uh, you know, I'd like to say that fight could have been really different if Slayton had gotten away from 444. Because 444 stayed on top of that sinking like Lou. Made sure that he couldn't, after that double stun of the Burrow Strike that came across in the middle here. As soon as that came out, 444 chased him around the tree line and made sure that he couldn't reset for an epicenter Burrow in seven seconds. So... I'm curious how the fight would have played out if Sand King got to do what he wanted there and reset, drop his ulti, drop another nice stun. I don't think they necessarily win the fight, but they don't lose racks. I think that they're able to get enough kills back the other way that they actually are able to repel the offensive. But, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. 444 is on the ball, stays on top of them. 
Current of Shadows and Rocket Flare, uh, along with just some good dust, is a great way to make sure that you keep the Sand King out of commission. Like, he's dropped some great stuns, Slayton has, but without the ultimate, this hero is still pretty ineffectual. Three ancients. Moving in towards the butterfly here. He's actually got all the expensive parts. And Tide even picks up a Heaven's Halberd. Who needs a dagger when you can just disarm the TA, disarm the tiny? And it's just a really rough spot for Vikings at this point. They'll keep trying, they'll keep fighting. Refraction now dispels. Okay, whatever that's worth. They'll take it to Spells and Feeble. Might dispel Shadow Strike. Either way, not a big deal. The Orchid. Well, you can't Orchid. You can't use your fraction when you're Orchided, so I guess that doesn't matter. Whatever. We have uh, a tight spot for Mad Kings. Um, Veil is what Sword thinks will bring him back into it. I'm not so sure. The AC on the Tiny will be pretty solid, though. That'll counteract the Life Stealers. Uh, AC in terms of armor production, and then it'll allow Tiny obviously to make the most of that attack speed. You'll note that he didn't actually go for the Echo Saber that he queued up. Okay. Shadow Blade into BKB. And you know, he did a lot with it. But in the end, I just feel like T-Show have gotten too much. Like you watch so much the Queen of Pain, you th put so much on the shoulders of PTT who dies over and over, but in the meantime, Theron is farming up insanely well. 235 on last hits. He's got 10, 1, and 8 on KDA. And he's pretty much as full as can be. He got this Midas very early on, just after his armlet. And, you know, you give him a Moon Shard, you give him really any other item for his last slot. Maybe, I'm assuming something with Strike. Hard to craft, perhaps. But, like, more than that, what, what can you expect? 4 4 4. Sees what he wants. He's gonna look for it, but it's gonna be, yeah, jump in. Infest onto Sonic Wave, blows him up, and Medora gets caught in the Fiend's Grip. Now, Slayton will cancel that out, but he's got really nothing left in the tank for this fight. He's gonna try to TP away. Nightmare will catch him out. And Medora, refraction blink away. I don't even know if he gets through this. Orchided, right clicked, and down he goes, accepts it. This, I mean, they're lucky that this fight happened on the dire side of the map, where these deaths aren't as costly. But it still doesn't put them in a good spot. They're still giving away so much gold and experience. And most likely a top tier, too. Yeah, Roshan won't be spawning for a little bit here. We see the timer. It's still got about 30, 40 seconds left on it. And that'll be enough for most of the bad kings to get back up. But even when they're up, what then? You go in against Ravage? I don't think so. Down bottom, tier three is focused, and really, Tisho don't have to be afraid unless the Templar is asking to fall. The Tiny, the Sanking, the Puck, they're strong, but they're not strong enough to beat Tisho. They need the TA, and she's too far gone. Um, Boger does that. I don't, he doesn't have plus 60 damage, so he can't rat the game, and that's it, boys. Some finales thrown out here, a few spells one way or another, but GG, WP, and that's the game. 34 minutes of action-packed Dota 2, and the end result is T-Show taking this series 2-1. to one. The game server has attempted to send match results to the game coordinator, and we'll have to see how that plays out next time on Dota 2. But in all seriousness, well played to T-Show. I think they really found what they needed to accomplish uh, in this third game here. Just building up massive farm on their carry and uh, fighting constantly. Um, there were a few outplay moments where they just were better at maneuvering in the fights. And then they really showcased the power of this Tidehunter. And just where he can just go forward without any fear of dying. And just be able to drop big ultimates when he needs to. So I love the itemization. I think they did really well. And I think that T-Show definitely deserved the win here going into uh, the uh, presumably upper bracket final of Galaxy Battle's South American group stage qualifier.
that's going to be wrapping it up for my broadcast here. We're going to bring on MRP Dota for the next one. So give him a shout. But I myself am Blaze at Blaze Casting. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed my opportunity to come back and uh, get out from behind the scenes and get in front of a microphone for a little bit here. Uh, it was a little rusty shaking that off, but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed nevertheless and that you will enjoy some Dota 2 coming up here shortly with MRP, Lucini, and VRFG. See you guys.